This evening I would like to explore a very interesting notion that Alan Watts developed in a very clever way, clever in the better sense, of course, in a book he called The Taboo Against Knowing the Self. Now, he said, there's a, have to understand there's a taboo against knowing the self. And that's certainly true. And in the book, he explores all the different views about the self or the lack of it in philosophy and psychology and sociology. And then he finally takes occasion to reflect back and give out his own view. It's a worldview. Now, basically, there are only a finite number of worldviews. I'd like to present several so we can then contrast it with what Alan is doing. The first, which is traditional Christian Hebraic view, is that there is a God, and God had an idea, and by focusing on that idea, he then generated the universe. And in the process of seven days, each day he looked upon it after the completion of the creation and said it was good. That means he was able then to look at what he did and compare it with some idea. And he pronounced the relationship between the idea of the universe or the model and copy as of such a nature as to say good as an artist might look upon his work and compare it with what the idea he had in his mind, and if he's satisfied with it, he would pronounce the creation as good. This therefore has a beginning and will have an end. This is the theological, Christian Hebraic theological view, and it also has a further development in Plato's Timaeus. So it is a Timaeus, Platonic idea of creation, different of course, rather than seven days, it's a whole development, metaphysical development. But in any case, we'll call this the theological model. Now, I'd like to give the next model as the Advaita Vedanta. The Advaita Vedanta holds that uh, this phenomenal universe as we experience it is actually our delusion. It's a delusion. We are deluded about the true nature of this phenomenal universe. Because if we ever were to see the nature of reality in that state of reality, we would, it would reveal itself as being non-dual. Now, non-dual strictly means now, from the Advaita Vedanta viewpoint, that there is no possible relationship between the phenomenal and the nature of ultimate reality. There is no relationship, and the example they give, which is a very fine example, is the old one of being in a forest or a jungle and you're shocked to discover a snake lies in your path and you run away from it, come back with it later with some friends and to discover that what you thought to be a snake was not a snake at all, but just a coiled rope. Now, you projected upon it the snake. That's a projection, what they call an imposition in Hindu terms. It's an imposition. Name, form, this is all an imposition. 
to ask about the origin of the snake and where it's going or what may come of it or the history of it doesn't make any sense because basically it's an illusion. Therefore, there is no relationship between the nature of reality and the phenomenal universe because it is in fact maya or an illusion. Now, we can now move in, into another image. And that is that whatever happened in the beginning was a big bang. And what we can see is simply the consequences of that enactment of the original big bang cosmic explosion and therefore the entire universe is nothing other than the working out of the implications of the Big Bang. Therefore in that sense the universe the universe unfolds from its origin And that unfolding is nothing other than the unfolding of time. Therefore, this view, of course, is uh, Stephen Hawking's. He presented it most dramatically in a book and a film called The History of Time. What's essential about this view is that the whole process involved in studying it uses a mathematical physical model which itself has no independent existence. It's an artifact, it's just a way of talking and describing. So therefore, the way we derive our knowledge of this is from an artifact and there's nothing particularly significant and eternal about the English language, and equally well, there's nothing particularly eternal about mathematics and physics. It just happens to be an artifact we use to understand it. In contrast to this view, it's essentially, it starts with the same basic idea that yes, there was a Big Bang, there is an unfoldment, here is the universe then, But this entire universe is not merely a history of time. What it really shows is the structure of mathematics. That is to say, if you really understand the universe, the physical universe, what you really are stu studying is mathematics. And that's the basic language of the universe. Next up, therefore, there really is, there really is a mathematics independent of creation. There is a mathematics. This is discovered, it's not invented, it's not an artifact, and therefore with this language we can use it to fully comprehend this physical universe of ours and solve it. What any Whatever problem that comes to us, we can solve it with our tools of mathematics. But mathematics itself presupposes a metamathematics. And that metamathematics takes a name. And that is the metamath metamath pardon me, metamathematics or a platonic, a platonic world of ideas. A platonic world of ideas sometimes called platonic forms because mathematics itself owes its existence to these platonic forms. Now this view, as you probably know, comes from someone who worked very close with Stephen Hawking, who is the author of this one, and he has developed some very interesting insights into the study of uh, mathematics and the universe and the geometry of the universe and his name is Roger Penrose.
And obviously, this is different from this, but yet it doesn't block these two men working together. And as this author, Stephen Hawking, did a great book called The History of Time, so this one did another great book called The Shadows of the Mind. Now, one, two, three, four. These are world views, of course. And there is another one, and that I'm going to present it, that the universe itself, the whole functioning of the universe, is much like the way in which the heart beats. That is to say, it's a pulsating. It pulsates. It's on and off. It's on and off. Dit, 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 dit. In that sense, it's very much like the structure of uh, uh, mathematical language, on and off, on and off, on and off. And therefore, it's on, and there's the universe exists for an instant. Then it's off, and then it's on, and then it's off and on and off and on. And this is captured, ideally, the model for this is the film strip. If you wanted to study motion, and someone had a camera that could take so many frames per second, and you said, I want to study motion, so I'm looking at each one of these to see if I can study motion. And of course, would you discover each frame is static? And therefore, even if you speed up the film a thousand or a million times a second, you still wouldn't be able to see any motion in any frame. Conclusion, it's between the frames that the action takes place. That's the same thing as this view, you see. It's saying that the entire universe is on and off, on and off, on and off. In the instant, the instantaneous moment is really a, just a flash then it's off, then another flash, there's no continuity, there's no continuity. They're just a series of flashes. That's all it is. Now, within this on and off universe, which by the way, this view has its origin, though it's, uh, this is the one we're going to talk about with Alan Watts, this really has its origin philosophically in Plato's Parmenides the third hypothesis, the third hypothesis of Plato's Parmenides. Now, on and off, opposites, 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 opposites. The very nature of opposites is integral, therefore, to this view of the nature of the universe. And there's a whole series of opposites. And that is, in this on and off, we stand here, we stand trying to grasp what it is we are in, our universe. And therein lies our difficulty, because everything in the universe, in our experience, is clearly other than ourselves. Clearly other. That's not me. I am not hurt by that. I am over here. It is over here, and so is everything. Therefore, we're always caught in this other pair of opposites called self and other, again, opposites. The self is represented often by the I in this immensity of the universe, seeks in some way to reach some kind of meaning, but it's always insignificant in comparison with the vastness of the otherness of the physical in the entire universe. Therefore, it's necessarily a sense of foreignness, foreign, alienated. 
Because whatever I identify as being the I seems to be totally different than anything I experience because I experience everything as other than I. And furthermore, the I only seems to exist for a certain period of time. And therefore, with our death, there appears to be therefore a return to non-being. And therefore, our existence only has being. Being in the sense of a vitality and a life, that's what it has, being life. Vitality, identity, that's all in the I. But in this, other than me, no I. Likely not much vitality, and if even if I'm pointing to an elephant having more vitality perhaps than I, it's still totally different than me. I can't identify with it. There's nothing I can identify in the universe except other eyes that seem just as foreign, as alienated from me as I am from them. This is the universe that Alan Watts presents, within which he is then going to explore this question of the taboo against knowing the self. This is the way he starts. He contrasts it, he contrasts it here with this theological universe. And he says, if you want to therefore talk about the origin of this kind of pulsating universe, it doesn't work. Here are the time-honored terms, God, Father, Creator, etc., all the traditional values. He said, you can't take these terms, these metaphors, and move them in here any more than he warns us. Can you take it and introduce them into this world of the Advaita? Metaphors are not exchangeable. Each worldview has its own inherent models, metaphors, and they're not transferable. Now, Alan is very interested in science. Therefore, he, for the most part, until late in his life, by the way, accepted this model, Hawking's model. Much later, he got interested in this possibility of an independent this view essentially is saying there may be an independent intelligence in the universe. And that was a great advance over his earlier thinking. And uh, we had fun one night in his houseboat, and we were talking about it. And he said, uh, Pierre, he said, uh, do you know there's some evidence to suggest that there really is a place out there in the heavens and the universe that in fact is the, is the origin of intelligence? So we're playing this way one night. And I said, well, I don't know about that, Alan. I said, but I do think I have an idea that whoever is going to discover it, I think I know his middle name. He said, What's that? I said, it's likely to be Parmenides. <laughs> so we had fun that night. But what the important point of it is, though, you see, he was moving from this to this. And now, he always has a loyalty, even though he talks about science. He also has a loyalty to Chinese thought. And when he talks about Chinese thought, he slips into a Buddhism because his Chinese thought moves into Taoism. And the Taoism that he's interested in most often picks up terms like being and non-being and that's where he moves. Now, what does he do, therefore, to bring this together to try to answer this question about the taboo against knowing the self? Well, the self that he introduces, he introduces in this very fine book called The Taboo Against Knowing Yourself. And I'd like to read you a couple of lines out of it because it's so interesting the way he expresses it. I'm on the book, subtitled The Taboo Against Knowing Who You Are.
We need a slightly shift in viewpoint, he says. And nothing is more obvious, this is his jumping off point, there's nothing more obvious than the interdependence of opposites. The interdependence of opposites. Now, wait a minute. On and off were opposites. Self and other were opposites. Being and non-being were opposites. You say, wait a minute, there's an interdependence between these. Ah! They're correlated, they're, correl they're correlatives, they're correlated. They're not opposites opposing one another, as if they are forces divided against one another and at war with one another. He says, no, 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 no. So what does he do with it? Is it possible that myself, my existence, my existence, the self, so contains being and nothing that death is merely the off interval in an, in, in an on and off pulsation, which must be eternal. On and off, on and off. That's this, on and off, on and off. Because every alternative to this pulsation would in due course imply its presence. Is it conceivable then that I am basically an eternal existence, momentarily and perhaps needlessly terrified by one half of itself because it has identified all of itself with the other half? Have I identified myself with just one half of this? On, self, I, being? You say, hey, you know, that's the problem. I have identified one half of terms which are interdependent. Ah. If I'm going to change my view, he said, you know what, he said, I'd have to revert to the myth of the ego as an isolated, independent observer from whom the rest of the world is absolutely other and nothing. But neither neurology, nor biology, nor sociology can subscribe to this. His allegiance to modern science, which he always does. Okay, now watch the way he pulls it together, just a couple of sentences. If, on the other hand, self and other, subject and object, organism and environment are the poles of a single process, then that is my true existence. That together, that is my true existence, all of these, right? because they are not opposed to one another, there's an interdependence between them, what am I? I am that which includes them both. And he capitalizes the word that. Self and other, subject and object, poles of a single process. That is my true existence. Then he quotes the Upanishads. That is the self. That is the real. That art thou. But I cannot think or say anything about that. Or as I, now, or as I shall now call it. Now he moves from the word that to it. It's not a that, it's an it. Capital I, it's an it. Unless I resort to the convention of using dualistic language and metaphors and analogies, as he says, what lies beyond opposites must be discussed. In terms of opposites? And that means using the language of analogy, metaphor, and myth. Okay, two more sentences and I'll take a pause. The difficulty is not only that language is dualistic insofar as words or labels for mutually exclusive classes. The problem is that it is so much more myself than I thought I was. 
so central and so basic to my existence that I cannot make it an object. There is no way to stand outside it, and in fact no need to do so. For as long as I am trying to grasp it, I am implying that it is not really myself. This is why those who really know that they are it invariably say they don't understand it. Okay? For for it understands understanding. For it understands understanding. That's the it. Because he just went through a process where he discovers and shares with us what he calls the self. He brings us to understand what it is, takes us through a process of understanding. He says, you know what? That, that's it. The it understands. And this is the understanding that it understands. And the it is that. That's it. <laughs> that's what he does. So, so how does he end the book? He ends up the book in a great way. I don't know anyone who can do this as well as he does. This is a totally amazing guy. <laughs> he ends his book with a Joyce Broughton little poem. This is it. And I am it. And you are it. And so is that. And he is it. And she is it. And it is it. And that's that. That's where he ends his book. <laughs> so that's that. And so he ends it that way. And, and so, you know, he's, he's quite a, you know, obviously, as everybody knows, he's so creative. He can take an idea and he plays with it and he turns it around and he uses all these different traditions as if they were particular paint colors and he then dabs around and does his little mosaic and he presents it to us and says, that's what I think today. Don't worry about it, he'll change it tomorrow. Right? A part of it, but he'll keep a certain, a certain part of it, he'll maintain. So this was quite, uh, as I remember, this was in the 60s that he did this. And uh, let me just make sure, 65 I think, 66. Yeah, no, this was 66. And as I say, later he, he shifted in the 70s, just before he died, and was now dealing with that real problem, which is the problem that Roger Penrose brings into thinking. That, hey, you know, there's something curious. There is some kind of vital intelligibility. And he started focusing on that, and that's where he was going. Um, I'd like to have some questions. I should have, should not have monopolized the whole thing. I just kept on going. Yeah, please. Um, could you explain the concept of platonic forms? Pardon? Yeah. Platonic forms. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that concept? I didn't quite grasp what that was. Is the, are, the platonic, yeah, yeah. are the platonic forms meta-mathematical? Is that the meta? Yeah. yeah. Um, would you agree, this is the reasoning, the way it proceeds, that if our entire universe were to end and all of the galaxies would be to finally end, but if there then was another creation, start all over again, or if our particular galaxy collapses and the other gal galaxy starts, it may be that some kind of intelligent being sometime in some place will... Two! That, see, the question is, is it likely they would discover or invent mathematics? Now, watch. 
Would you agree if anybody somewhere comes up with a straight line, they might then say, you know, if we hold this line and then rotate the end of it, point B, you know what, we could have a circle. And in the same way, if we held this point stationary and rotated this, hey, you know, it's likely it would intersect at another point. And if I draw a straight line from here to here and here to here, you know, I wonder whether that would show that the, the triangle I just drew is an equilateral triangle. Because all you need is a straight line and just a simple mechanics of rotating. In other words, is it likely that mathematics would be rediscovered? If it's rediscovered, not invented, then it exists. That is, if you have any kind of being, whatever it is, with sufficient intelligence, it will in some way discover a world of mathematics. Is that a possible way of talking? I'm not trying to convince you, but is that a possible way of talking about this? Okay. So, all mathematics, according to uh, a book that, that uh, was very famous at the turn of the century, uh, written by Whitehead and Russell, called the Principia Mathematica, um, they studied mathematics and they came together, Whitehead and Russell, and they said, I think I can take all the mathematics, the whole thing, and reduce it down to symbolic logic. And so they did this massive work called the uh, Principia Mathematica, and they reduced all mathematics to a simple formula. And they call this a molecular proposition, fundamental. So you can take anything in mathematics, you can reduce it to this fundamental molecular proposition, which says, a is related to B in a series of ways, as C is related to D in a series of ways. That is to say, any, relate, any two things can be related. Therefore, that presupposes if there are things in the universe, then these things can be related in such a way that you can talk about their sameness and differences, can't you? Well, if you can talk about any two things in the universe, you can talk about only two things. I mean, there are only two things in the universe. They're either things or relations. Well, therefore, you can also talk about things and relations. So let's talk, this is a relation. Let's talk about another relation and call that C and D. Would you agree we can also compare relations as we can compare things? Oh, then I can compare this with that, can I not? Well, when I do that, I'm saying A is to B as C is to D. That's an analogy. Therefore, the fundamental nuclear proposition that Whitehead and Russell is, is can be understood in this way to be nothing other than the fundamental the fundamental analogy that governs all analogical thinking. Oh, well then, wait a minute. If you take the first and the third term in any analogy, right, then that's how you generate similes. A is to B is C is to D. I can say, okay, A is like C. Oh. God is to his universe as an artist is to his, is to his project. Oh, see, A is to B as C is to D. God is to the universe as the artist is to his project. Hey, God is an artist. See, A is to C. I can create a whole bunch of similes, can't I? Right? Oh! But wait a minute, didn't we say a moment ago that God, God what theological view is that uh, God had an idea in his mind, and on the basis of that, he generated the entire universe, therefore the whole universe, the whole universe is nothing other than 
like the model. Therefore, the fundamental principle of the entire universe is likeness, isn't it? The idea of likeness. If things could not be like one another, there couldn't be a universe. Therefore, the condition of likeness precedes the generation of the universe, right? Hey! That's curious. In order to have likeness, it looks like you have to be able to compare. You have to be able to compare things and relations. And then you can compare relations and relations. Now I can take this analogy and instead of putting A, B, C, D, ah, phooey. Let's substitute numbers. Two is to four is three is to six. Okay, when you move from, when you move from heterogeneous, different hetero, <coughs> to homogeneous terms, that's mathematics, see? Homogeneous means they all belong in the same class. So therefore, mathematics is nothing other than an extension of the knowledge that we're using homogeneous classes, right? But in, in analogies, you're dealing with hetero. These terms are different. God is different than the universe, as an artist is different from his project. Therefore, the differences, they belong in different classes, not in the same class, but you can then Hey, wait a minute. How is it possible then that I can do this? How is it possible that we can talk this way? Doesn't that mean in some way that I'm drawing you in to reflect in a certain way about what must be present before creation? Look here. God couldn't have created the universe unless there was an idea in his mind. The idea in his mind must have been a model. Oh, if there's a model, then it can be a copy. Oh, therefore, these ideas must pre-exist before creation as the very condition for creation. Oh, by the way, if there's any relationship between the model and the copy, then you can say it's a good production, did we not? But if God... If God is, is uh, the kind of a God that can only do good things, then it's likely then whatever he does that is good will also be beautiful. Huh. Well, therefore, necessarily, therefore, there must be such a thing as the idea of the good and beautiful, right? Good and beautiful, model and copy, now we're deriving a set of fundamental notions, are we not? That must exist prior to creation. In order to talk about creation, those are the conditions, Platonic ideas. These are the forms. The model presupposes God. Does the Platonic forms presuppose a God? Yes. These all are are together and imply one another. They all interrelate. They're not separate and distinct. They imply one another. And therefore, it is a oneness. Agree? When all things interrelate in such a way that they can imply one another, you have a perfect oneness, a unity. By the way, wouldn't you agree by the same logic that if there is such a thing as a oneness that presupposes there must be a one prior to it? Therefore, above the idea of Platonic forms must be the idea of the one. And since all beings are attracted to what is good, therefore, as people are attracted to the good, wherever they, whatever they judge to be good, they're attracted to it, and they desire it, and they desire to possess it, so long as they think it's good. Therefore, all things naturally are attracted to the good. Therefore, the idea of oneness presupposes one, and that one must be the object of all desire, therefore it's called the one or and or the good. <clears throat> okay? So, that's a oneness. It presupposes, therefore, the existence of beauty and all of these formal properties existing independently of a creation. And therefore, that, you see, 
when we were thinking together, and I brought you into it, a Platonist would say, at that moment you are participating in this realm. To the degree that you are following it, you're participating in this world of ideas. Right. Then I showed how that can be understood in terms of analogies and mathematics. Right? We brought you into that. Therefore, in a Platonic world, you are then participating to some degree in these realm called the forms. These are called forms. Ideas. Another word for it is an idea. For, excuse my long-winded explanation, but that. Uh, oh. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. Good. Can I help you with any other way? Good. I'd like to just recollect something for those of you who probably know Alan Watts or heard about him and relate to him. That evening where we had this talk about Parmenides, which was a lot of fun, he ended it by toasting and uh, several drinks to, in honor of all of those people who had such high and lovely and beautiful conceptions. And he uh, chanted a uh, Gregorian chant. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for letting me share it with you. It was a lot of fun. Any other questions about it? Good, good, good. Thank you again.